Yeah, and I've been uh and I've been ducking Alex for about a year now. I had to go back <laughs> in my email and say, oh my God, I, I just don't want to do this. Um and you know, You're one here. of the reasons why of course everybody's busy for sure. Um but you know it's really interesting and, and I think I've somewhat uh, struggled to some extent of, you know, what the heck am I doing in science? What the heck am I doing as an assistant uh, professor? And, you know, in thinking about what I'm going to actually talk and share with everybody, I said, you know, it's, I think it's really important to talk about maybe some of the, you know, the unconventional uh, work that I do associated with science and my position. Um, you know, I'm from a small community in Northern Ontario. We don't know anything about scientists. So if you're any good at math or science, they try to funnel you into uh, medicine. Right? Da -da -da. Yo, fantastic, right? So I decided to go to the University of Ottawa. Despite having never visited University of Ottawa, the only campus that I visited in high school is actually University of Guelph. Um, but for whatever reason, I, I didn't choose Guelph. Um, but, you know, I, I went through this process, you know, so, okay. Better get ready to become a doctor of some sort, but it sucked, right? It was really, really boring. It was not what I thought that I should be doing as a scientist. So um, after that, you know, after kind of going through some med school applications and that type of stuff, I said, you know what? Well, I'm just going to stop it right now. And to the uh, consternation, you know, to the disappointment of my family, I decided to go to wine school, right? So I went over to Brock University to join the Cool Climate Technology Viticulture Institute to learn about winemaking and how to you know taste wine better or how to think about wine a little bit more sustainably but actually to think about the entire process the holistic nature of wine right from uh, the creation of cultivars the maintenance of genetic diversity in cultivars to the planting to the pest management fertilization regimes all the way to the processing and the actual uh, marketing to people right to, to me that there's a lot more there so oh, that's science right that's a really cool integrated system and this is a, a really cool institution and, and to some extent right this fueled I think a lot of my childhood dreams um from the moment <laughs> that I was young I've been asking uh for alpacas for Christmas right we have a pretty sizable property back home and on the North Shore of Lake Huron every year I'd ask for alpacas um, even when I was in grad school in Montreal, I even had illegal chickens. I think urban chickens were illegal at the time. So I had chickens on my balcony and they started a really cool uh, urban chicken website. I just recently bought my first house here in Winnipeg. And, you know, the literal first thing that I did after buying this house was modifying a chicken coop to have some racing pigeons. And so much of my career, you know, this really fascinating interest in science, like learning, building all sorts of interesting tools to evaluate, say, you know, genetic diversity and something like blueberries. You know, it's the goal for all of these has really just been to bring me closer, bring me back to the land, right? To get me out of this ivory tower to some extent and utilize my love for science to actually be able uh, to benefit, you know, different systems, not necessarily people, different systems, different organisms, um, to think about something a little bit beyond uh, what we think of ecosystem services. And, you know, this is where I'm from, right? So it's important to, you know, do land acknowledgements. It's important to talk about where we're from. Uh, you know, I am uh, from Misagi First Nation, right? Blind River is the town I grew up in. Our community, our peoples, uh, you know, really gained um, their culture, developed their culture, evolved who they were as people while living near Lake Ontario, right? So Mississauga, there's a reason Mississauga is named Mississauga, right? It's named after all of us uh, Mississauga Anishinaabe Bays that uh, eventually had to move out, were displaced. And again, just looking at the map where I am at up here in the north, right? The, uh, you know, it's not the best agricultural soil, uh, but there's still agriculture that happens there. We can see that, you know, the where most of uh, Ontario's Anishinaabe Bay uh, communities evolved were in Southern Ontario, right? Where this fascinating, you know, really productive soil actually exists. So, you know, if I'm a, you know, a colonist, it makes sense. Oh, this is the place where I wanna live. So let's displace indigenous people. You know, and we have all sorts of stories of multiple stopping points, right? Just moving further and further away from that ongoing force of colonization to where we are right now in a, on the North Shore of Lake Huron. 
Um, so this is my community. It's about five minutes from where I current where my parents currently live, right? Again, right on Lake Ontario, or Lake Huron. Beautiful, beautiful place. Um, you know, Mississauga, uh, we're named. Uh, we have a river that's also named Missis the Mississauga River. Again, a beautiful, a beautiful bird's foot delta, right? With, you can already see all sorts of sediment deposition. You can already imagine the fertility at the mouth of this river. You know, uh, unfortunately uh, for us, if you look just beyond the horizon in the top left, we have Cameco, uh, a nuclear upgrading facility, right? That kind of refines and, and improves uranium. Um, again, on probably one of the most sacred, you know, ecologically diverse and important areas, uh, we have a nice golf course and, uh, again, you know, this uh, industrial facility there. But, you know, the one thing I wanted to really talk about where I'm from is, again, you know, it's not the best agriculture, but if we zoom in on the map, right, we can see, oh, look at all these cool farms. Right. What is it about, you know, just slightly uh, west of our community that we have all these farms? And then as soon as you hit our traditional territory, well, there's no more farms. And, and this is something that, you know, I still wonder to this day. Yes, of course, you know, we probably have the worst selection of land in, in the area. Um, and, you know, I think that's something that is really uh, sticking with a lot of Indigenous communities and Indigenous people to this day. Uh, if you ever uh, travel across the Trans-Canada, um, prior to the little bit of a bypass, you used to pass Garden River, right? And we'd have this really cool train bridge with this uh, interesting art or graffiti um, of this is Indian land. And I think it's important to acknowledge and remember that all that research that we do um, in Canada whether it's, you know, on land that's, um, that the government likes to say was given up uh, via treaty or not, you know, it's actually traditional land. And again, that formation of Canada, the reason why we're all, you know, a lot of people are here is because of the displacement of Indigenous people, right? The peopling of North America was based on this idea that there is so much free land. So why don't all our European uh, cousins and relations come to uh, Canada or the U.S., take up this free land, start farming, right? There's just this fantastic amount of land free for the taking. And to some extent, right, that's, you know, that creates a, a really um, disturbed image of agriculture. If we look at who are the agricultural major producers in Canada, it's these really, really big landowners, um, these people that have all this land, where an Indigenous people have you know, such tiny, tiny, tiny pieces of land right now. So I, I took on this job at the Faculty of uh, Agriculture and Food Sciences almost as a challenge, right? I think a lot of people view agriculture in a very particular way, but I view it in a way that oh, I think there's all sorts of really cool possibilities. And again, one, one of my personal heroes, uh, Michelle Obama, even her, even her work that uh, she wanted to do at the White House, right? Just doing a small little uh, community kitchen garden for the White House just outside, um, I can't remember the, the one of the sides, maybe outside the West Wing or kind of the Northwest side of the White House. She just wanted to have these gardens and really start to think about how to uh, create local food and some food sustainability. But we know agriculture is rife <laughs> rife with a lot of conceptual issues and how we think agriculture is or what we think agriculture is. And I think this is also, um, this also happens in science. So, you know, people thinking or her people talking about uh, Michelle Obama, right? They'll use coded words like the first lady's food fetish to kind of make it seem as though gardening or trying to have local production of food is, is somehow, you know, a little weird or a little bad, right? And it even becomes a, a political issue, right? The fact that Melania Trump didn't want to continue Michelle Obama's garden. You know, that was a, a political issue seen as, you know, the, the Trump administration wanting to support big egg. And, and again, I guess, okay, maybe it makes sense. I, I really don't actually know much about uh, politics, but, but we know it's an opportunity to bring people together. 
right? We know growing food is at, at the foundation of who we are as people. Every culture at the foundation of who it is as food as something really important. You know, after World War II, we know in the U.S. there was this huge push to make sure that um, local schools and local community centers were planting victory gardens. Again, this was not just to subsidize the uh, low production that was happening after the war due to, you know, lack of manpower and to some of the environmental conditions that were hitting the east, uh, the east coast at the time, right? Really drought, poor agricultural conditions during that period. But again, it started to create some expectations of, you know, what we should be eating, how we should be eating. And it's something like the Victory Garden that led to a lot of what we consider um, pretty normal now in terms of lunch programs. Victory Gardens were the forerunners or the forebearers of some of those school lunch programs and the legislation associated with them in the U.S. So, you know, this is how I learned and, and probably developed a lot of my love for science, right? Just gardening and gathering and learning about life cycles and um, the natural history of the environment with my grandparents. But again, we know <laughs> even that simple act might be seen by some as, you know, dissing big agriculture or distorting the environmental impacts of agricultural production, you know, vilifying an industry. Right? We even have, you know, these lobbyist organizations, which, which again, you know, are, are, are full of uh, agriculturalists, full of, you know, people associated with agricultural markets, but also full of scientists, full of people wanting to do agriculture better, right? We have their representatives, you know, poo-pooing this idea of people talking about something as, you know, basic as a, a sustainable uh, local community garden at the White House. Um. So, so again, I kind of just wanted to highlight, you know, these debates over relatively simple things in my mind, right? The growing of something as uh, as small, as meager as um, a, a local garden shouldn't be a big issue. But, but I think this applies to science and we don't necessarily ever think about our assumptions or, how, well, you know, those that those elements that form our ideas of something like science, similar like these people in the agricultural industry might not necessarily understand or be self-reflective enough to, to to realize what they're actually promoting or what they're actually lobbying for. So, you know, one of my focuses right now in my lab is kind of, you know, learning myself, you know, what is food? You know, what does that actually represent? And for me as a scientist, how can I interact with something like food or agriculture in a more integrative or in a more holistic way to actually build science or build land management tools to actually allow um, what I do in the lab or what I do in the field to benefit not only producers, but also people that you know have really um, unique links uh, to their food systems or, or to the land. So my title slide had uh, you know, honeypot ants, right? These really fascinating ants that, you know, there's so many different species on, on, on different continents. Um, but when I was first introduced to them, I was introduced uh, to them uh, by somebody like David Attenborough, right? So David Attenborough, again, we, we know he has all sorts of interesting documentaries. He has all, all sorts of interesting documentaries. And this is one that I remember growing up, you know, this is the, maybe I was five, six years old, maybe when, when I saw this, and it was, oh, it was fascinating to me. So oh, ants are a bit of a nuisance. But then I saw and I started learning about these honeypot ants, right? These ants that served as emergency foodstuffs for Aborigines in Australia, right? These uh, ants that um, were really important as, um, you know, as these indicators of habitat, as indicators of certain conditions for Indigenous peoples. And it took a while before I actually started thinking about, okay, I am learning this from David Attenborough. That seems a little silly when we know that uh, Aborigines, Indigenous people in Australia have really deep connections to these ants. Connections that go beyond just their value as a, a potential food source. 
Um, there's this concept in uh, a lot of Aborigine communities about this honey ant dreaming, right? This idea that honey ants and the way they form their colonies and their societies actually represent best practices, represent um, all sorts of, you know, spiritual or, or philosophical goals of how we should assemble society. Um, it also was the inspiration for uh, you know, Aborigine dot art. So in the 1970s, it was uh, honey ants that really drove a lot of that early uh, Australian art. And here's the community uh, where we have a lot of that first art coming from, right? Again, you can see the concentric circles. We can see that they even formed uh, the, the roadways and how they operate or where they place things based on some of this idea associated with the honeypot ant. So right now at the university, you know, I, again, I'm trying to learn myself, right, and even teach myself up a little bit on how to better think about science through an agricultural lens to actually be able to better serve uh, society, not just Indigenous peoples, but to serve society and to meet those goals that we're doing um, as scientists uh, to, to, to be valuable to the world. And, you know, I'll talk about a, a failure initially, right? This is what happened when I first became a professor. I said, oh, you know, obviously I love bees, right? That's kind of the organism that I uh, am probably the most apt to, or the best, uh, I have the best aptitude to actually work with. And in Manitoba, as in most provinces, if we look at bee diversity, we know a lot about bee diversity close to the Trans-Canada, in Southern Canada, right? But we have very little understanding of the bee diversity in the rest of Northern Canada. So this is just, uh, these are just records. All these little bees represent uh, different samplings and surveys that have been taken over the past 50, 60, 70 years uh, in Manitoba that we have in our collection. And we see nothing, right? We see very little bee sampling outside of Churchill. Um, but we see a lot of interesting red space, right? And this red space is just traditional, or not traditional, but uh, current reserve. So these are all indigenous communities. So in my mind, well, this is an easy solution. Let's task, or a little task, let's partner and collaborate with Indigenous communities and, you know, and ask them, you know, let's identify plants that are of, you know, some cultural relevance to you and let's build little packages or let's build little programs in high school or in elementary school to allow you to survey those insects, uh, potentially, you know, increase or have a better understanding of something like pollination of wild harvested blueberries and create a more happy, a, a more fulsome Indigenous community here represented by my baby Yoda. So, so in my mind, this was a really easy project that would, you know, cover a lot of things. We'd be really building out pollination uh, biology understanding in Northern Canada. We'd potentially be contributing to food security. And again, we'd be bringing in Indigenous communities uh, into science. So I applied to, this was a CIHR for whatever reason, but it failed, right? We had, yeah, sure, we had a bunch of uh, Indigenous uh, representatives and leaders and elders and knowledge holders come down to the University of Manitoba. Uh, we talked about how to build out this project. No, but the, the project didn't actually result in much. Sure, right? I had, we had this really nice title, Revitalizing Indigenous Food Traditions and Knowledge. Sure, everybody thought that that was a good idea, but it was really basic, right? It was so simple. I was focusing very much on the natural science side of things. Again, we we're trying to evaluate how this would improve social emotional well-being. You know, these terms that are, you know, you can measure all this with qualitative methods. Yeah, so yes, we had we had a really nice protocol of methods, but you know, it really didn't ring true, right? It really wasn't important to the community. It wasn't important for them. Uh, or was pollination or pollinator conservation important to them? 100%. Was food security important to them? 100%. You know, but the way we presented it probably was uh, what well, was probably our, our first miss, right? Our first strike. And, and again, something that I don't think uh, we scientists or, or people in the, in, the, in the science field actually think about is why science? Why should I utilize this method to evaluate anything? Right, if I look at my own knowledge system, so 
you know, the, the seven grandfather teachings or, or, or these fundamental principles and concepts upon which our people have built uh, their indigenous knowledge system, you know, these values are, are really different compared or relative to the values that uh, we look at, uh, we look for in good science, right? Repeatability, objectivity, um, being able to, you know, uh, 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 falsifiability, right? Those things actually are not part of our knowledge system. So again, this you know, pushed me to start thinking about you know, how do I do science that's more responsive to maybe even my own values, but also valuable to everybody. So one of the things I like to say is, you know, I have a the side hustle. My uh, my main job uh, is actually uh, with the federal government. So I'm a researcher in residence with the Office of the Chief Science Advisor, where I'm building out uh, not only you know Canadian policy, uh, but I'm also seconded over to this interdepartmental Indigenous STEM cluster, where we gather up. Uh, all sorts of secondees from all the uh, science departments in the federal government. And we explicitly work on trying to build not only a better capacity within the federal government amongst our scientists and how to engage and collaborate and co-develop with Indigenous people, but also how do we create that um, space? How do we change and modify our policies to actually be able to be responsive or relevant to Indigenous values or concepts? Right, so we do things like, you know, we're trying to build out an Indigenous data sovereignty a strategic plan. Um, we're working on uh, trying to uh, identify priorities in community-driven Indigenous knowledge, uh, strategic science priorities, right? Again, we're trying to figure out what do communities need? Where do they need that support? Um, you know, and, and again, we're doing a lot of work on just changing the conversation associated with science. This is just a, an idea of some of those topics that we covered in our workshop where we ran a uh, hundred plus uh, federal researchers through, uh, you know, a really cool training curriculum to get them to start thinking about what they do as science. And, and maybe, you know, this might not be a surprise to anybody, but I think we all can agree that we need better science, right? We have such fantastic science, but none of our societal problems ever seem to be solved, right? We do a pretty good job at, you know, potentially integrating, uh, you know, Indigenous knowledge at the local scale, right? We bring in Indigenous knowledge holders. We might even partner with Indigenous people to collect and sample. We give them a little bit of input into land and resource management systems, depending on that system, right? If it's something like fisheries, no, you don't want Indigenous people involved with that, right? We, we know that's a, that's a, a no-go for our provinces and the federal government. Social institutions, oh, we start to struggle a little bit more despite the increase in hiring of Indigenous scholars and Indigenous people in uh, the federal government or in academic institutions. We were struggling there. I, and I think even Indigenous people themselves are struggling within these institutions because the work they want to do might not necessarily align with what they should be doing as an assistant professor. And, and beyond that, within all that, right, we know that there's this overarching worldview of what Indigenous knowledge is and what, how does that actually relate with science, right? We often do this dichotomy of this is what Indigenous knowledge is and this is what uh, Western science is. We, we have this perceived um, these differential principles, these differential approaches that, again, doesn't necessarily allow us to integrate these knowledge systems in, in a way to uh, actually make it operationalizable or make any um, advancements or management tools operationalizable that kind of bridge or utilize these concepts. So, you know, some of that stuff that we're doing is, you know, again, we're just trying to play catch up. Because even though maybe we're not responsible, us today uh, are not responsible for the poor relationship that Indigenous communities might have with academic institutions or science or, or even settlers, um, it's up to us to actually start thinking about how to, um, you know, how, how to repair some of that uh, really poor history of, you know, Western institutions. Um, this is just a, a project that we're working on right now to kind of identify communities, researchers, and, you know, those stories that uh, tell us about, you know, previous extractive research, but that, it, uh, you know, a lot of that motivation and some current projects that are looking at um, doing research in a much more uh, collaborative and co-developmental way. 
I'll, I'll skip this slide and kind of getting to this idea of, you know, what is indigenous knowledge? You know, we <laughs> oftentimes I give these talks and people talk about uh, indigenous knowledge is um, all this really sacred knowledge that might uh, exist in, you know, pristine environments. But it, in my experience and uh, those of my mentors, we often find the most interesting, the most relevant, the most useful indigenous knowledge, you know, adjacent to uh, a municipal, uh, to municipalities, to development, right? This is just the ditch uh, next to my house. And I probably learned more about ecology here than I ever would have uh, near uh, the Cataract Falls, just again, outside five minutes away from my house. Right, I learned more about ecology and our understanding or and our relationship with the environment in you know this kind of sucky uh, pond outside a lumber mill near my town. And you know, it's remembering some of these experiences that have me trying to develop a research program that highlights or identifies science as more than just a way to optimize or find that best practice to manage a system. This is my favorite corn variety, the Gaspe Flint corn. And you can imagine, oh, nobody in the right mind would actually grow this if they're interested in agricultural productivity. You know, but it's cute, right? It's a, a super cute little baby corn. Um, and actually it was really useful uh, during those periods of colonization. Uh, you know, when the first settlers came here, they had the unfortunate luck of being here during some of the worst, worst, coldest growing seasons uh, that the eastern uh, seaboard has ever experienced, right? So it was a short growing or a short, a fast maturing uh, uh, cultivar like the Gaspe flint corn that, you know, was enabled colonization. And again, right, science is an opportunity to retell the history of who we are as people, right? We have this idea, or previously, maybe some people still hold on to this idea that, you know, North America or the Americas was ripe for colonization because there's nobody here, right? When the settlers first came, they'd look at these landscapes and they'd say, oh, these are really interesting landforms. Oh, this is a really interesting cleared area, but they wouldn't actually think about why these areas were cleared, right? A lot of them thought it was manifest destiny that, you know, God or some entity, some deity uh, set this land up for them to perfectly start, you know, doing whatever they had to do. But we know that, you know, North America or the Americas was under such intense management that the loss of indigenous uh, land management actually drove uh, cooling globally. Right, so Coke did some really interesting work utilizing all sorts of different measurements to look at land and in use intensity prior and after colonization. And you can see after colonization, a lot less land use intensity, right? All, obviously, a bunch of indigenous people died, right? 90% of indigenous people uh, died after colonization, resulting in a lot less agricultural development, so on and so forth, um, resulting in that regrowth of trees. And that regrowth of trees sequestered so much carbon that it led to some cooling, right? So when we start thinking about indigenous land management, so, you no, know, it's not just indigenous people, you know, being, you know, sacredly in sync with earth, right? They're really looking, they're, they have their own ecological approaches and their own ecological understandings to optimize particular services, right? Again, this is just examples of uh, forest fire management across uh, the Americas, you know, always for different purposes. And again, when we start to overlay some of this more comp, uh, yeah, more different types of land use uh, or land management techniques, we start to see, oh my God, yeah, a good proportion of North America was, um, you know, manipulated or managed. And again, thinking back to my parents and my grandparents, right? Even trapping, it, trapping involved all sorts of land management after uh, trappers in our area in Northern Ontario would be done um, trapping and harvesting, they'd light fires, right? And these fires, of course, yeah, it's made uh, next year's trapping a little bit easier, right? It created all these corridors, um, but it was planned in such a way to, you know, um, minimize damage to refugia, to uh, maximize connectivity between habitats, uh, to uh, minimize competition, right? So fire had all sorts of purposes that were not just human-driven. They were looking at building ecosystems, 
So we could look at something like, you know, the story of corn, right? That evolution and that selection from Teosente over to the that modern uh, corn cob that we see with all sorts of kernels and, you know, really high um, energy. Uh, uh, yeah, it was providing humans with a lot of energy. But then we don't necessarily think about how did it fit into uh, traditional indigenous communities, right? Amongst the Navajo, right? We have this idea of corn at the center of all societies, right? This is similar to the idea of tree of life in, in many European cultures. It's corn that is that thing to be uh, deified, right? It's corn that enables humanity. It's corn that enables diversity. It's more than just some agricultural product, right? It is that lifeblood to the ecology, to the spirituality, to the culture of people. And again, we can start to go through all sorts of, you know, science technologies uh, that might be, or technology and understanding of science that's captured in something like uh, crop varieties, right? In temporary bean, we see that there's been this isolation of cultivars of varieties, right? A lot of foliage that's more adapted to uh, wetter, moisture, uh, more moist areas compared to the tenifolius that's a bit more adapted to dryland areas. Again, this tells us about the challenges and about the adaptations and the agricultural systems that existed at the time, right? A lot of these agricultural systems don't exist in the Southwest anymore. And it continues to potentially fuel um, agricultural innovation. That's, again, something that we forget that, you know, the vast majority of beneficial traits uh, that we utilize still to this day in uh, crop selection and cultivar development were actually uh, developed, selected, and, and maintained by Indigenous peoples selecting those cultivars, right? So a lot of that diversity that we have in our land races are, are you know, we're still benefiting to this day through, um, you know, selecting those and making sure we're emphasizing those in new cultivars to potentially solve problems like uh, increasingly uh, increases in drought in a lot of agricultural areas. You know, and science, land management decisions, and you know, uh, experiments and legacies, you know, also tell us about people that actually might not be here. Right, so these are the, if we look at the bottom here, we have the Snake Town Canals just south of the Pueblo Grande. And these were developed by the Hohokam people, which don't exist anymore, right? There's very little beyond some, a little bit of arche archeological evidence of who these people are, right? They had really complex um, uh, canal management systems, right? They had uh, these woven mats to kind of divert water to particular areas. Um, but it's also, uh, an area where we have some actual fascinating conservation biology happening, right? It's only in these canals where we see sizable populations of the Colorado pike minnow or the razorback sucker, right? These endangered species that actually likely can't persist anywhere in the Southwest beyond these canals. So yes, you know, this agricultural development was probably very important for something like, you know, irrigation for their crops, but it's also this mutualism with species, this kinship. And I think we have to start thinking about science uh, as uh, this mutualistic interaction between us as humans and environmental uh, consequences or environment or species or habitat. Hey, again, one of my favorite examples is, you know, this work showing the uh, expansion or, or the original range of a cucurbit species and its expansion as people started to share and diversify um, squash agricultural across North America that also led to the expansion and the uh, increase in geographic distribution of a specialist squash pollinator, Peponapsis pruniosa. So we can think about all these uh, really interesting creations of new habitat, right? That's not something we necessarily associate with agriculture. Similarly, we know when, you know, the big mammals of North America went extinct, that squash itself didn't have a seed disperser any longer, right? So it was humans that took on that role. And there's that relationship, this kinship between squash and human is that drove all sorts of interesting diversity. Sure, we have all sorts of eating squashes, but we also have all sorts of util utilitarian squashes that are might be used for um, storage, right? Storage vessels might be used for ceremonial purposes. 
And I think we're at that level right now that, okay, we know that indigenous knowledge, indigenous science is important. I, I probably don't have to explain anymore why we need to bridge or find tools to allow both of these systems to operate. We know that uh, you know contemporary modern science often identifies or discovers things that indigenous people already knew. But we also know it might be an opportunity to actually figure out how to better influence policy, how to better manage some things that are really complex and hard to manage, something like a fisheries, something like a, a lobster fishery that has all sorts of um, different inputs, right? Indigenous science, indigenous knowledge is a really holistic system. So it's not just about the natural science. It's not just about the data, right? It's about who you are as a person, connecting with these species, uh, connecting with the environment, connecting with the land. It's an opportunity to think about the rights of people, the rights of the indigenous rights, but potentially even those rights uh, to something such as race, right? The race should have, wild race especially, should have a right to be there, right? It was here before all these cottagers were here. But again, we know cottagers are continually removing uh, wild rice from their lakes because they want to do boating, right? They want to enjoy uh, their summer lake house. So we have to think about how we can integrate and build science and build conservation and build land management that still allows Indigenous people to, you know, participate in something like a modern, you know, industry like wines, um, but also allow um, allow that uh, conservation value to actually really uh, be highlighted. And we know we have to start rethinking of who those experts are, right? Uh, we have elders, we have knowledge holders, but we also you know, tend to neglect youth. In Indigenous societies, uh, a lot of our uh, cultures and societies and our land, uh, our, our land decision-making processes are matriarchal. Right, and even in science, right? When most of our faculties, we still don't have good representation of something like female, uh, professors, right? There's still a bit of a, a gap between, um, you know, gender equality, gender parity in a lot of these fields. So, you know, pushing and identifying some of those uh, ways to uh, bring in more diversity is really important because, again, it's reestablishing some of that historical order, this historical way that uh, communities were governed. But getting back to, to a little bit more science, I think it's important for all of us to think about what does science mean beyond just science, those facts, right? Something like this example with honeybees, where uh, a lot of early Indigenous communities thought of the honeybee as the white man's fly, right? It wasn't this uh, organism that provided honey. It was this organism that signified colonization, the, you know, that, that scary uh, approach of white people coming to take your land, right? So it's probably a, a negative idea. And again, we know that science actually happened in residential schools. We have some pretty horrific nutritional nutritional research that took place in residential schools, um, experiments on kids to, you know, again, improve our understanding of the nutrition that led to um, Canada being a leader in vitamin research in the early 1900s. That was done on Indigenous people. So you can imagine things like science, things like agriculture, where um, residential school students were forced were more so farm laborers than students. All these concepts, you know, really probably don't gel nicely or probably don't bring up nice memories. You know, our current um, movement towards, you know, identifying, you know, those few crop cultivars that do everything really well, again, drives the loss of all sorts of stories, right? There's stories, there's history, there's familial relationships uh, with a lot of those uh, species or a lot of those subspecies cultivars uh, that a lot of communities uh, have maintained. And as we go on every year, we're losing that diversity, we're losing those stories, we're losing that knowledge. And again, you know, this is something to easily forget, even when I was doing my master's on blueberry research, right? One of the big findings to kind of promote better uh, blueberry productivity was we had to manage clone size to minimize inbreeding depression. You know, I tell my family, oh, look, I found this really cool um, thing that blueberry farmers should do. You know, my family looked like, well, duh, Kyle, we knew that. You know, your grandpa actually used to do the fire management and the blueberry plot management for our community. Again, I was even ignorant uh, to some of this knowledge. And even when I go back to my community, right, we were building all sorts of greenhouses and these really cool domes. Uh, this is in an area that, you know, I previously established some gardens and said, oh, this is probably not the most, 
you know, the best way to have like a productive agricultural system. You, you're using, you're wasting a lot of land. But, you know, again, what I wasn't realizing was it's not just about food productivity. It's creating this learning opportunity. It's creating a link with agriculture. It's creating links with food, right? This might not be the ideal productivity or a system for production of food, but it's the ideal system to learn and teach uh, the next generation about those links and that responsibility that we have to plant uh, to plants. So even now I'm going back into uh, some of my um, research from previous students and trying to identify how we can actually build out um, a, a little bit of uh, indigenous leadership in some of this work. Uh, my student Massimo did two projects. He sampled bees across um, these road corridors, right? Uh, they were associated with breeding bird survey sites. And he also surveyed um, in these power lines, right? In Manitoba, we have these huge expanses of managed area under power lines. And again, we were just kind of thinking of, you know, these power lines, these sides of roads as representing a really fantastic opportunity for pollinator forage to exist, right? Most of uh, Manitoba is either developed agriculture, really sucky scrubland or forest, right? So these break up, these breaks in the landscape can present an opportunity, a habitat for all this really nice poll pollinator forage. And yes, we, we found all sorts of cool relationships. Right? We can think about all our different eco zones uh, having, you know, different trends in uh, bee biodiversity. Um, uh, this is the same here. I'm, I'm missing a slide. Uh, we can even see that different management types, uh, grazed habitat seems to have, you know, very simple networks while, uh, while um, something like integrated vegetation management when we're managing, uh, you know, a little bit more um, nuancedly and not just kind of mowing everything tends to drive biodiversity and a little bit more network resilience. You know, yes, we found all sorts of science there. It's really cool things that we're hoping to publish. But something that we hadn't thought about is, you know, Indigenous communities in Manitoba have a really poor relationship with Manitoba Hydro. So potentially this work not only can, you know, help us preserve some of these uh, pollinator networks, but it also might present an opportunity for uh, communities to start uh, being leaders or starting to have a say or starting to identify indicators that they want Manitoba Hydro to meet in terms of managing some of this land. So a, a lot of my work right now, or to be, to be honest, I, I don't do any work. It's all my students that do all the work. So a lot of the work that my students are doing now are looking at how we can diversify some of these conventional research uh, methodologies in pollination biology to actually be able to inform Indigenous knowledge or create space uh, for Indigenous peoples to start asking questions themselves. Uh, this is a Three Sisters project that my student Victoria is working on. So we have some collaborators from the University of Guelph. So we are at some of the research stations. And again, we're at some of the research stations here in Manitoba. And it was initially kind of developed just to, you know, understand how polycultures or um, diversity within a crop field can drive insect community abundance and, you know, just drive diversity. We also wanted to understand, you know, if, you know, having more diversity in a farm system or in a cropping system is going to amplify or optimize uh, things like pollination or pest predation. And again, of course, you know, we're doing ag stuff. So we want to see if this actually drives even better, uh, even more production um, uh, than a monocrop, for example. But again, I didn't want to make, you know, we were, were very cognizant of not making that same mistake. So, you know, maybe not everybody's interested in just insects, you know, beneficial insects or pest insects. Uh, our community partner last year was actually interested in, oh, maybe the crop residue or, or the remnants of this experiment actually can drive biodiversity that might be more important in the fall, right? It might bring in deer. So of course, yeah, we know deer love eating all, <laughs> basically eating all of our experiment. So again, thinking about agriculture and this little system as benefiting things that we hadn't even initially imagined as part of our project right now. You know, thinking about, you know, ecosystem services like pollination and um, uh, pest predation, yeah, that's good for an agricultural uh, focused person. 
but it actually doesn't think about some of those that bigger suite of ecological services or ecological functions, right? There's a lot of cultural services uh, em embedded within our definitions of ecosystem services. So how does reestablishing something like a Three Sisters Garden actually build culture, build community togetherness, build uh, that interest in science and wanting to advance Indigenous knowledge? You know, again, and yes, of course, we're going to focus on crop yield. That, that's just something really basic. But again, how do we, you know, modify this science to think about how does bringing in Three Sisters or how does growing Three Sisters actually influence that community well-being, right? Here's a, a small little project that we ran with some uh, Indigenous community partners where we're getting them out to the fields. We we're getting them out to research sites to think about what does that modern contemporary agricultural system for you look like? And, and again, all these things have really fascinating links to uh, solving some gaps that we see. We know things like pollination deficits are not spread evenly. Communities that um, are more reliant on pollinator derived or uh, communities that are reliant on nutrients from plants uh, reliant on pollination tend to be those that are you know, worse off, right? Those would tend to be these communities that are uh, not the uh, rich communities, right? So it's poverty tends to be linked to reliance on wild harvested resources. So again, we're trying to think of ways to, um, you know, optimize uh, something like Three Sisters and, and create that um, system where Indigenous people themselves can start to ask questions. Maybe they don't even want to do the Three Sisters. So we're looking at uh, working at full factorial um, full factorial designs in a lot of our projects to be able uh, to inform uh, to inform kind of those choices by Indigenous people. Maybe they don't care about corn or sunflowers or bean varieties. Maybe they just want to emphasize certain crop varieties. So again, we're, we're doing all sorts of interesting research, not necessarily to kind of fuel advances in pollination ecology, but to create um, these I don't know what you call them, but maybe these research sites across Canada to actually um, allow conversations to happen between, you know, research researchers in these facilities and Indigenous people to allow them to ask their questions. And again, we're, we're failing a lot, right? This is a, a project that lasted only about a year, uh, but we're trying to create links with community and people to actually um, start to teach them, start to uh, give them the capacity to identify what they want to learn, what they need uh, a little bit more knowledge in, and what we should be developing courses to target. Um, and again, this is kind of just a highlight of, of some of that work, right? We're, we're building, we, you know, the fact that we brought out tractors to till some land in an old bison ranch in a local community. That was the key um, outcome. It wasn't all this other work that Victoria is doing in research. It wasn't all this other um, work that's going to come from the publication of some of this research. It wasn't even the educational program that we designed for this community. It was the fact that we're just willing to help with some of the development of the uh, community's agricultural capacity. That's what was, uh, that was the big outcome. That was what was the most important here in that community. So again, right, I'm trying to take science as a, a reparational opportunity by rebuilding capacity in local food systems, by allowing communities to start to direct um, you know, how should we conserve? What should an agricultural food system focus on? And, and again, this work is um, contributing to all sorts of interesting ideas and in how we uh, start to develop, designate, and manage uh, lands that are put aside for uh, the conservation of species. Um, again, that's a, a whole other talk that I'd love to get into, um, but I'll, I'll leave it there uh, and kind of finish my rant off by just saying uh, thank you, miigwech.